But can I say a warm welcome to everybody joining us as you're entering the room. We've still got a number of people to join. So I'm Anita Taylor and I'm here at Drawing Projects UK welcoming you but also speaking later. Um, so please do let us know where you're joining from in the chat while we take a few minutes as people gather. So you've got a few minutes to settle in and get comfortable, but please do tell us where you're joining from. Fantastic. Great to see people from Chippenham, from Lancaster University, Norfolk, Athens. That's wonderful to see someone here from Greece. We have people from Metro Vancouver in Canada, from New Zealand, uh, from Oxfordshire, from Bath, from Fife. Great to see everybody gathering, people from Chippenham. So, so we're quite well, well spread today from London. Uh, we're very popular in Fife, which is good, uh, from Stockholm and Sweden. Really great to see everybody connecting through these opportunities to talk together and to have a drawing discussion. Great to see Philida from Cookham, Alison from Bournemouth, North Wales. I'm not sure who the iPad is from North Wales, but lovely and welcome. So we've just got a few more minutes. We will wait a little while for a few more people to gather. So do get comfortable. I'm sure everybody's in, uh, certainly in the UK, in a chilly area. Um, but lovely to see you all connecting together. Great to see Matilda from Hexham. <laughs> and please do let us know where you're joining from, but please mute. Uh, once you've joined. Hello, Nigel from Hinton Charterhouse. Everybody getting comfortable, which is all good. I'm keeping an eye on Fiona to let me know when we should start. A couple more minutes. So please do get used to using the chat because you'll use the chat to ask questions through the, throughout the evening. Um, so great to see Judy from Devices. Lots of regulars to the Drawing Project sessions, but also an, a number of new faces. So it's really great to see everybody. Yeah, minus nine. Liz, where are you? It was minus nine in Dundee yesterday. So cold, Chippenham's cold then. Um, that's all good. Brilliant. Um, we think we should start the evening. So I'm a guest on the panel this evening. So I'm going to hand over to art historian and curator and co-director of Drawing Projects UK, Gary Sankster, to chair this evening's drawing discussion, Excavating the Past, Drawing on Archaeology. So thank you very much, Gary, um, for taking over. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anita. Um, thanks to um, the panelists who, who are here tonight and to all of the audience who's tuned in online to um, uh, engage in this drawing discussion, Excavating the Past drawing on archaeology. This is the final online panel discussion associated with Sarah Casey's exhibition at Drawing Projects UK, Emergency uh, by Sarah Casey. Um, and it's a celebratory event too. It's our Christmas New Year event. So we do expect people won't drink during the seminar, but you're welcome to drink between now and the new year. Um, the purpose of this panel discussion really is to hear from four quite um, different artists who are going to be reflecting on their specific engagement with archaeology through the lens of their um, practice of drawing. 
we have um, three uh, academic slash artists and one academic um, artist student who's speaking with us tonight. So our first speaker, I'll introduce the four speakers briefly. I'm assuming that you've all read their impressive biographies um, and are familiar with their practice based on the biographies that were published, but I'll just briefly introduce them. Faye Stevens is an archeologist and academic, a writer, a curator, and an artist. And she's an adjunct professor in archeology span and sustainability studies at the University of Notre Dame, um, USA, but in England. Professor Anita Taylor is an artist, curator and educator, and is Dean of the Duncan of Jordanstone College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. Sarah Casey is an artist and writer and a researcher, academic, and senior lecturer in drawing and installation at Lancaster University, and is currently the director of the School of Fine Art there. And Helen um, Chichenikau is an artist, a younger artist, primarily working in drawing. She graduated from Lancaster in 19, in, sorry, 2022, and is currently a student in um, Contemporary Art and Archaeology MA course at Orkney College. So now I'd like to invite the first speaker um, to make a presentation, um, Faye Stevens. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to this evening. And I want to thank Drawing Projects UK, um, Anita Taylor, Fiona Cassidy, and many thanks to um, Sarah Casey um, for your wonderful and um, inspiring um, work. If I can have the next slide, please. I'm an archeologist trained in theoretical landscape archeology. span I've worked on archeological projects around the world and research and lecture in archeological praxis through a transdisciplinary prism. For five years, I was part of a groundbreaking cross-disciplinary project developing phenomenological techniques in theory and practice. This has shaped how I work as an archeologist, as an academic, curator, artist, and writer. And I see these, this list, <laughs> not as separate things that I do, um, but much more a rounded, holistic, sensorial inquiry. It's my ethos, my philosophy, my being in the world, to use a phenomenological um, turn of phrase. Next slide, please. I work a lot with charcoal. Um, and one of the reasons I do that is charcoal is the material we use to date ancient archaeological sites. I experiment with its materiality, how it works, what it does, how it relates to other materials. And this is aligned with a phenomenological inquiry and the work of the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, whose work I very much draw upon, um, because his work was concerned with essence and perception. And as an archeologist, I'm interested in the essence of places and the sites and perceptions of them. So to quote Ponty as a guiding prism through which I will um, talk um, briefly today, visible and movable, my body is a thing among things. It is one of them, it is caught in the fabric of the world, and its cohesion is that of a thing, but because it moves itself and sees itself, it holds things in a circle around itself. Now I want us to hold on to this idea of body being a thing among things caught in the fabric of the world. Next slide, please. So I do a lot of drawing experimentations around essences and perception. Um, I'm curious about the haptic qualities of things, and I've explored this, for example, in a series of drawing works concerned with elements and the arboreal world. And you can see some images um, here from a residency in um, Somerset of the wonderful um, Great Yarford um, tree collection. Next slide, please. And also drawing works engaged with walking, fluidity, migration and environment that also taps into my work in sustainability as well. And this is a series of works from a wonderful residency I held um, in um, Spain at um, Hoya Arts. Next slide, please. Walking is central to my work. 
It is, as the writer Rebecca Solnit says in her book, Wonderlust, A History of Walking, the way that body measures itself against the earth. So I'm interested in this idea of the body as a measure and drawing as a way of articulating that measure. And I continue to explore walking, drawing, sound works and curation under the wider lens of um, embodied cartographies. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk about, um, about three projects to just work a little bit deeper into those um, ideas I've just introduced. As an archeologist, I excavate time, place, material and memory. This project, Malathros, which has at the moment about six iterations, utilizes drawing as a portal through which history might be um, undone. Now, this is a bold statement, I know, and one that rather perplexes me <laughs> in the sense I'm not entirely sure what this drawing performance work is actually doing, if indeed it needs to do anything. I could give a whole presentation on this and I really must write about it, but here I just include drawing works from a residency workshop in Berlin. And I went to Berlin and with a particular idea about what drawing work I was going to do, and it was not what I intended to do in this residency, but I was compelled to continue with the Malathros work that I had been working on. It's a work about a small village in Crete, the Second World War, Berlin, memory, and the number 62. In this residency, in this place, I drew charcoal lines around the building, rather like a conceptual map. I drew into Permatrace, which is a technical paper used by archaeologists in the field. And it's a paper I predominantly work with. I smudged charcoal lines and redrew over them. I tore Permatrace drawings up, rolled them into small pieces and inserted them into the cracks and the crevices in the building. And this still intrigues me. Um, there's much to say about drawing, archaeology and excavation here. Broadly speaking, looking directly at the image of me inserting a rolled up drawing into a crevice <laughs> into the building, I think I was in the process of turning the gallery, once a house in Berlin, into a drawing somehow. A powerful act of breathing life back into lost history and back into lost lives. Next slide, please. These series of works emerged from an artistic residency with the artist of Kapushvar in Hungary. Um, Kapushvar is twinned with Bath. This residency held in the small village of Sivetgar is a small village with a very large castle. And the well-documented siege of the fortress of Sivetgar in 1566 was fought between the defending forces of the Habsburg monarchy under the leadership of Zerensky, a Croatian-Hungarian nobleman, and a general and the invading Ottoman army under the nominal command of Su uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. <clears throat> to start with, my drawing work for this residency was going to be about the natural ecosystem and environment of the internal space of the castle. But as I learned more about the history, I once again felt compelled to draw as a form of excavation and to take care and attention about the past, rather like the work I've been doing with Malathros. So here I took Permatrace and I wrapped it around the corners of the castle because I saw the corners somehow as iterations of two sides of conflict and that the drawing was perhaps a process of bringing them together. I think I was seeing the drawing as an act of peacemaking. I used traditional archaeological um, technical drawing techniques and materials used for standing buildings drawing, but I included absolutely everything in the drawing texture, decay, erosion, um, the structure of the drawing, the materiality of the place. So in the top left two images from a niche in the castle walls to the top two right images to the entrance of the mosque in the center of the castle. And there were many more layers of drawings like this, which I then placed together and I layered together as a drawing palimpsest, which is the bottom two images you can see in the slide there. And, and the drawing changes. If you change the layers around, the drawing has a different manifestation of the process there. So because of that, I see this as a fluid drawing because it changes as you reorder the layers and as a process of, of unifying and bringing together the past conflict that resonates in this heritage site. Next slide, please. 
these are ongoing drawings um, that take the enigmatic, decaying, wonderful Swanage Old Pier, Swanage in Dorset, as its starting point. Here I draw with charcoal, permatrace and seawater. And these three materials are incredibly reluctant to work together. They resist each other. And so my studio turned into a laboratory of experimentation and observation, in which the characteristics of the materials I worked with acted as metaphors for the enduring presence and stoic nature of this old pier. Because things endure, they resist, they buckle, they bend, they decay, and they hold on. And these drawings are working through of that process. And in a sense, the materials were, were echoing the, the resilience of the pier still standing there. These are also living drawings, uh, an ecosystem of the ecology of the seawater to dwell in the seawater that I used in the drawings itself. Um, and this is also ongoing. I'd kind of like to work on this project in a much larger scale. Next slide, please. Over the past three years, I've been curating a site-specific project for artists at Bath Artist Studios, and it's based at the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Avebury and involves site-specific site visits, gatherings and workshops. My drawing work for this project, in many respects, is a drawing conversation I'm having with the antiquarians of Avebury. In this slide, I'm working, I'm sorry, I'm working, <laughs> I'm already, I'm drawing with um, William Stukeley's, I'm drawing upon William Stukeley's 1723 circular drawing of Avebury, transcribing that into a technical drawing process, and then responding to my technical drawing process with a conceptual drawing, um, an interplay of technical and one might say untechnical drawing. And then the next slide, please. And here my drawing conversation is with the antiquarian John Aubrey, who drew a quite brilliant 17th century drawing map of Avebury, and in particular of the Avebury ditch, it's the image to the top right. These are what I call ditch work drawings, inhabiting the negative space of the henge. Walking in circles, my body, to go back to Merleau-Ponty, is a thing among things, caught in the fabric, of the world of the Neolithic monument, the drawing eye and corporeality of John Aubrey, and 21st century notions of heritage. Um, and I just want to thank the Bodleian Library who, um, for the use of the John Aubrey map. I've been researching his work um, over this year. Next slide, please. Quiddity, I found, is a rather wonderful word, in part, that helps explain why I'm doing what I'm doing in my drawing practice the essence of someone or something. And this is ongoing, explored through drawing works of haptic memory, cartography, place and materiality. Next slide, please. I've been working through this <clears throat> with um, a conversation between two phenomenological cartographers of the west coast of Ireland, myself and the late Tim Robinson. And to quote him, I am the pen on the paper while drawing this map. My pen is myself walking the land. Next slide, please. Two drawings that have haptic qualities of the materiality of, in this case, the geological strata of a very archeological rich area on the west coast of Ireland in Connemara. And the next slide, please. To drawing as both a macrocosm and a microcosm of um, excavation. And this project quiddity and this process is something I'm um, exploring now in a series of drawing works um, around the River Thames. <laughs> um, and I hope to be excavating, um, exhibiting some of that work at the beginning of next year. Next slide, please. So you can watch a short presentation on the um, quiddity project, the two slides I've previously just shown you on the wonderful um, drawing lockdown symposiums run by Drawing Projects and the UK, and I do a short presentation um, on that as well. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. Very brief um, overview of my drawing work as a process of excavation, and I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with you um, further. Thanks, Anita. Uh, thank you very much, Bay. Um, Sarah Casey will now make her presentation. Yes, thank you, Gary. And um, thank you for firstly hosting the exhibition and also for um, hosting the series of talks and having us all here um, 
this evening. It's a, a great delight to be able to follow um, Faye's fantastic um, presentation um, and a tall order to follow, but I'll do my best. So what I'm going to talk about is my recent work working in particular um, bringing drawing into the context of glacial archaeology and um, following a project that I've been doing with the support of the um, Valley Cantonal Museums um, based in Sion in Switzerland. And my interest in this topic, next slide please, has grown out of maybe um, almost kind of 15 years of being really interested in what the activity of drawing shares with the activity of other disciplines that must negotiate um, material which is ephemeral, hidden, unseen. And this has grown out of staging various kind of collaborative projects with other professionals such as archaeologists, medics and um, conservatives. So that's a, a, um, the background that I'm coming from. Next slide, please. This particular project, which is called Emergency, um, was named after reading this quote from Rebecca Solnit. Like Faye, um, I found Rebecca Solnit's writing really formative. And she writes that inside the world, emergency is emerge. And this idea that from an emer emergency means that things that come out of it. And it seems an apt way of thinking through glacial archaeology. Um, so, in case you're not familiar with glacial archaeology, this is the term used to describe archaeology, which is um, found in sites like ice, ice bound sites. These might be ice patches or they might um, and they might be in the high alpine, high alpine areas or they might be in northern um, Arctic location areas which are, have been covered in ice. Um, I should point out, although it's actually called glacial archaeology, it's more frequently the finds are found in actually static ice patches. Anyway, those that, that I've been interested in have been those that have been in, in the European Alps, um, most specifically in Switzerland. And what interests me about these are these are artifacts emerging out of the ice as a result of, as the ice melts, essentially. Um, and obviously due to the global climate emergency and the increased heating, objects are in, now in, emerging at a kind of an unprecedented rate. And these artifacts are particularly valuable because the conditions of the ice are particularly arid and cold. It preserves things that wouldn't ordinarily be preserved, things like leather, textiles, hair. So they in, contain incredibly valuable information about the human past, but obviously that comes with the cost of this lost ice. So this is an entanglement of the kind of human futures and environmental natural futures and the two aren't so separate in them so it's this both this entanglement of the two histories but also this way that they kind of point to the future and talk about a story of climate that is perhaps um less seen and what i was really interested in through a i, I did a fellowship with the henry moore foundation was how the languages of drawing with its processes of a kind of erasure um marking absence and presence, um, space and solid, how these might be used to try and think through this kind of appearance through disappearance and think through it, but equally how this context of glacial archaeology might help us think more about what drawing might be able to do and what it means to make a drawing, which is essentially a kind of process of marking. Next slide, please. Um, and just to think about drawing, um, drawing has long been equated with ideas of archaeology. Tony Godfrey talks about drawing as an archaeology of acts of touching, meaning with each successive mark, there's kind of layers. It keeps a record of the trace of the maker in that, which can then be read by somebody or interpreted by somebody viewing the drawing. Equally of, of making a drawing of the subject of actually undertaking a drawing, the act of being the artist, John Berger has described that as being like a burrowing in the dark, a burrowing beneath the, par the apparent. And I think in both of these, there's unfolded this idea of, of kind of layers, getting beneath the surface, getting down, um, which kind of resonates with how, as lay people, um, we understand archaeology. Um, Faye used the word palimpsest, this idea of kind of layering things being up on top of each other. And um, we'll see that very much in my work too. Next slide, please. So um, this sh shows two artifacts of that have emerged um, through my process of observing these artists, um, 
artifacts of glacial archaeology. So back in 2018-19, I went to um, visit a display at the Sion History Museum called Vestige en Paris about um, artifacts about glacial archaeology. And this was curated by Pierre-Yves Nico. And Pierre-Yves has since been incredibly generous and helpful and supported me to help understand what was going on with these artifacts. So I used that that, that initial period of drawing was using my sketchbook in front of the artifacts to try and bring myself close to them, to try and understand what it might be like to touch and see, handle, experience them, like um, a phenomenological experience of the artifacts. What resulted from these were the works that you're now seeing on, on the screen. And these are drawings that are made by sandwiching graphite dust between two sheets of wax paper. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what you're seeing here is a kind of, you can see it's kind of very transparent layers with the dust um, trapped there. Wh why I ended up at this process, so I'm taking these sketches, which are quite, um, they're representational, they, they contain like data or information, the kind of record of me observing these artifacts, and then back in the studio trying to use these materials of wax and graphite dust to create a visual experience or a tactile and material experience that is adequate to that sensation that I had of viewing these artifacts and also thinking about the material art material precarity that these artifacts um, embody, such as these shoes and personal um, belongings that were found in ice. Um, next slide, please. So some of the early stages of this work involve taking these kind of layered up drawings of, of the graphite traps in the wax and kind of layering these up and playing with what that would look like to see these layered together. Um, next slide, please. And then later in the works that have evolved um, and gone forward to exhibition, um, works which are large scale sheets of waxed paper, multiple sheets in which artifacts are then layered up on top of each other. And one of the things that I should point out about a glacial archaeology, which is maybe slightly different to terrestrial archaeology, is that because they're in ice, this is also a kind of shifting surface. It's melting, it's thawing, it's moving as well. And so you've got this kind of sense of movement and things which might appear if it's trapped in the ice, the ice melts away. There's no context for that artifact once it's emerged. You can't read the soil around it to understand its history. And in any one year, you might have artifacts from 50 years ago or 500 years ago, or maybe even 5,000 years ago. So it's not like in this kind of sequential layering, um, which is um, maybe the kind of conventional way of thinking about terrestrial archeology. span so moving on, next slide, please. So I made these layered drawings made with the sheets of wax paper. And the reason for doing that was that the drawing is then just these dusty, dusty fragments that are then trapped shut between the, the paper, which of course, if it gets too hot, it's gonna melt away. And that's the conundrum that these artifacts embody is if they get too hot, they're gonna, they're gonna disappear and they're very vulnerable. Um, next slide, please. And alongside that, this is just one of the images of the work on display at, at Drawing Projects. Um, next slide, please. And another, another view of, of the exhibition. You see these kind of crumpled up um, pieces of paper as well, as if, as if they've been discarded. I mean, many of the artifacts are actually stumbled upon by, by chance, and they are things which have been overlooked or fallen away into the glaciers. Next slide, please. So what I think I'm trying to do here is create, use drawing to poetically or imaginatively translate material properties to talk about, put into, to communicate an experience which might be challenging to put into words. That difficult tension between the absent and presence, which maybe can't be resolved. And there's a wonderful quote on screen now from, from Philip Rawson, who talks about the role of drawings that kind of enable us to kind of feel things within our bodies that we might not have been able to access. And in drawing, in reading those traces, how marks have been laid down, sensing their material presence, the image and and the support that enables the, the artist to kind of awaken the viewer a kind of sense of the, the subject, a sense of ideas. And I hope what, that's what the drawings evoke. And just moving on to my final slide briefly. And so taking this idea of the drawings which are embody the kind of material precarity of the artifacts, um, what you're looking at now is looking forward to kind of the next stage of the project, which is making drawings which are scored into um, 
waxed um, paper. And these were then over the, this summer in July 2022, taken back to some of the alpine sites and then exposed to the sun. And what you're looking at now is, is um, a drawing which was exposed for two hours. You've got before and after. And what so what's happened is obviously the heat of the sun, the agency of that heat has melted um, that drawing. So if you like, drawing has become this kind of anti-drawing, the kind of erasure is the act of erasure is recording the intensity of the heat. So rather than something simply being lost or passing away, the drawing then acts as a testament to that loss or might it even be transformation. So um, this is work in progress, which um, I hope to be developing next summer through a residency um, back in Sion with um, the Cantonal Museums of the Valley. Um, so, and I think what I'd like to end with is just thinking how drawing might be able to embody these ideas of passage, time and ephemerality and create a kind of poetic record that enables us to talk about things which are maybe hard to see or get a handle on or, or understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, really appreciate that. Um, Anita, uh, can you... Um... I Make can. your presentation now, please. I can indeed. Thank you, Gary. And I'm delighted to be speaking as part of this um, session, but I'm going to talk about a very specific project uh, within my work. Um, and this first image is an image of me arriving in an archaeological site in Turkey and my shadow on the historical site. It, the, the project... Um, that I'm going to talk about was started in 2019. Um, it's a project that became known as Lines of Sight, Kazi Itleri, uh, which was a, a research project just developed by uh, an organization that supports an archaeological site in Turkey, Ashikli Hoyuk. Um, and it was really established to develop an intercultural dialogue between art and archaeology, so both between cultures and both between disciplines. And the outcome of this project, it was an EU funded project, which included a number of artists responding to the site, which is this extraordinary um, site in central Anatolia. It's the site of one of the earliest human settlements. It's 8,200 to 7,400 BC as a site. And it's a really unique site in Turkey in that, um, there's very little material culture. So what you can see are the structures of the site and the human habitation and evidence of how people lived on the site for a fixed period of time before they left the site to go somewhere else. So it's an extraordinary settlement. It's got layers of um, history and that they've actually cut through um, part of the site to create that. But in 2019, um, it, the other thing that I should say about it, which is really interesting, is it's a multidisciplinary archaeological dig. So it's led by Miraban Osbasaran, who's a professor of archaeology at the University of Istanbul. The deputy director is a, um, an archaeologist from a different university. And the site has all sorts of investigation underway through um, looking at agriculture, looking at all sorts of different aspects um, that surround understanding how we live as humans and how we did live as humans thousands of years ago. So the project was determined, um, initiated by their experience of working with artists and residents over a period of time. And this idea was that they would build a group of artists, both working from Turkey, but a group collected together from the UK and the connections in the UK, working with Eva Bosch, who was an artist who'd worked with them before, but building a group of artists to think about how they might respond through material culture to a site without much material culture. Um, so it involves setting up a concept, it involves site visits, it involved individual research, working alongside the researchers dedicated to the site, consultation with those archaeologists, producing work, exhibition development, a tour, public programming, and actually a return, which we'll talk about. So the site is this incredibly atmospheric site. Uh, as you can see, these are from the first visit in 2019, uh, meeting with the chief archeologist Miraban 
uh, who that my arrow is showing. I think you can see that. Um, and looking and thinking about how to respond. I'm an artist who has a very studio-based practice, but I'm also very interested in how the experience of place, site, residencies sparks a different dialogue. And this was really an invitation to see how to respond through any means, through my practice to the site. It's a site that has experimental houses that test how um, habitation existed. So these are experimental houses are half behind, below ground, which absorb, dealt with the heat and cold issue. And they have within the houses, they found hearths, but they've also found burial um, spaces which were within the houses themselves. And this image on the left gives you a sense of the layers where literally they can see layers of time and sedimentation uh, of the habitation as they're finding things through the dig. It's set in the hook of a river, um, so water is important, which contains the site. These are to give you a context. Going out to the site, I went because I'm really curious. Um, I wanted to, to see this amazing place and have that amazing opportunity to do that. I really didn't know how I would respond to this. Um, but finding that connection between drawing and archaeology in such a simple form with Miriban talking us through diagrammatically about the relationship of the site and how it's constructed is an immediate relationship for drawing. So this drawing basically in the earth to talk about how we communicate um, ideas, concepts, understanding of mapping, shape, landmass, and, and, and interaction with that space. For me, drawing is um, a fundamental means of communication and expression. That's a great example of it at work. Um, and we spent time really just exploring the, the research house that they have next to the site where the finds are gathered and catalogued and examined. So it's really a, a research center on the side of the thing. So you have an image of artists who were out there to explore whether they would be involved. You have the discussions about how we might be involved and a setting of a context. So I drew on the site in order to understand my place in the site, to understand what I was looking at, to find what my connection was with this space and that connection may or may not have become any deeper or more meaningful at this point. There were things which are current, so on the right is an image from the process of one of the artists involved in the project, Dilwyn Smith. We knew that they had dyes that they made from verbascum, which is still prevalent on the site. We knew that they had fantastic opportunities to use something called obsidian, which is the, the result of the defunct volcano nearby, um, and that this was used as a cutting tool. So there are thousands and thousands, hundreds of bits of cutting tool on the site. And there are also really other wonderful discoveries, like one seed, uh, which was found while we were there, which is, a, is an ancient seed from, a, a, from wheat, or I think it's wheat or barley, because they grew crops um, from which they made beer uh, and other things. So it's a, an excavation thinking about how they lived and, and testing that. Um, so using charcoal and burnt embers to recreate some of the things they may have done to make vessels. And they've obviously, the, the image on the right is a reconstruction of a burial. Lots of amazing things. One of the most critical finds that they have on the site is this skull, which bears the evidence of early um, brain surgery. So those are drilled holes into the skull, um, made done with obsidian drills to, to create a medical procedure. The evidence of this young woman whose skull it is is that she lived for a period after that time. And so obsidian is this extraordinary, glassy, sharp, uh, extraordinary stuff. And the, you know, big lumps of it um, sit there, which obviously have been used and transformed uh, as materials. <clears throat> but one of the things about its qualities, of course, it's glassy, it's reflective, and it was made into mirrors. Um, so the images on the right are uh, images from other sources. The image on the left is the mirror that sits in the museum from the site. Um, so it's hand-sized, and it would have provided, if you like, a very early opportunity to see what you, you looked like yourself by using a mirror. 
<coughs> excuse me, for me, that's super critical. My work has been about how we understand seeing ourselves, our position in the world, and is based fundamentally on understanding how we don't really see our own selves objectively. We have selfies and cameras, but they still do something different than understanding the perception of ourselves through two lenses of the eyes, and obviously the, the psychological relationship that we have with images. And I've been making work about mirrors and looking and understanding that paradox between what we look like, what we feel like, and what we see, and how others see us for uh, decades. So I make work which is really exploring the presence of an individual within a space that refer to material and imagery bound by looking in mirrors. Um, these are a sequence of large drawings which are propped as though they are mirrors uh, within a gallery space, exploring that sense of looking, capturing the glance, uh, and whether that's a viewer capturing the glance or the audience, or whether it's the self capturing the glance through drawing. I became very interested in how drawings become part of their environment and the nature of reflection. Here they are shown in Wells Cathedral. Um, and making work that was really very much about the, the idea of witness. Um, so on a very large scale and dealing with intimacy on a large scale and the sense of being looked at and looking back um, to make very large scale drawings which operate spatially to invite you in and are quite enveloping, uh, but they're also quite challenging in terms of their scale and their sense of trying to deal with the private on a public scale. And these are really to give you context and size and scale. So coming back from Ashikli to the studio, this was a project interrupted by the pandemic um, and the sense of not being able to do all of the field visits, but thinking very much about the things for me that connected to the site, uh, which was not about tracing the space, but it was actually about trying to find a space across time to what it was like to be human in that space using the evidence that was there that talked to us about both the presence through that skull, but also in terms of the mirror. So I made from that a sequence of drawings which responded to the sense of uh, skull, memento mori, the actual skull with the, the brain surgery and the sense of looking across time by using a mirror to draw in the present. So they're large scale, hewn drawings if you like they're made purely in carbon they're about dust there's something that accretes dust in order to make using a material that would have been available as you saw from the trial uh, making those vessels um, but using drawing to to find a way to make that connection both as a reflective discursive practice and iterative practice but also in terms of thinking about the the sense of a, a present live um, space between our present time uh, and the skull um, back in that period um, of uh, Neolithic history. So the project is rounded. It's clearly I was one of 13 artists working on it. My sense was the making sense of what must be one of the earliest, if not the earliest, mirrors um, found out of this amazing material and that sense of the first moment of being able to see yourself in something you could go back to, so not a moving uh, temporal uh, medium of reflection uh, like water uh, or other ways of seeing, but through this sense of the obsidian. These are to give you a sense of the project scale. It's a huge investment. It was an EU-funded project. It had huge investment uh, from uh, the local government. Um, and huge impact in terms of trying to find a way for us to make that connection, that discussion through drawing, through contemporary art, to reach a back and to find and make sense of our culture uh, in terms of how we've lived and on from there. And it resulted in a series of exhibitions back in Istanbul, uh, in a historic hammam, um, and then it then toured to Dundee, to Barcelona, back to Aksarai, where the museum of the site is, um, developing other dialogues through this process of a dialogue through making and thinking and during thinking through making, 
Um, and then that dialogue definitely um, having another iteration from the place as a contemporary art exhibition in Istanbul to a conversation in the research culture of a university in Dundee to the research culture of an archaeological department in Barcelona and back to the museum itself. So it's a project included an uh, amazing set of artists um, and it's a project um, that in a way had a rounding as an experience. But I wanted to just talk about the very specific experience of thinking about how we discover things through the act of drawing and that act of trust to explore um, and to relate to different experiences. So mine is very much not the territorial mapping um, and landscaping that a, a mapping that drawing can do, but actually thinking about how we create a dialogue and connect to the past through experiences which are essentially human and essentially about being human. So thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, Helena, would you like to present now, please? Um, first of all, thank you, Sarah and Drawing Projects UK for inviting me to talk. And uh, yeah, my name is Helena Czechenikov and I am a student of Contemporary Art and Archaeology MA course at Orkney College, uh, part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. As far as I, as I know, at the moment, Orkney College is the only place in the UK offering this kind of course. And I joined you today to talk briefly about this exciting and unique experience of being a student of contemporary art and archaeology. Um, I decided to study it because I am obviously very interested in the connections between these two disciplines. And I have also always had an interest in exploring them through my drawings. I have also decided to move to Orkney for the duration of the course, even though it is also offered online. I am very glad I did that, as Orkney is a truly inspiring place for anyone interested in archaeology. The whole archipelago is full of history, which is often preserved to an incredible degree. Most of my work involves walking through the Orkney landscapes, drawing on site, collecting experiences, and often small objects such as rocks, plants, shells, or bones. The feeling of place and being there is an important part of my art practice. I am very interested in the layered nature of time that can be effectively explored through the study of places and their structure. My interest in contemporary art and contemporary drawing and archaeology is very clear and I think that the course is really perfect for me. I am learning a lot about the art and archaeology and I can tell you that there is no single answer to how these two are related to each other. When I tell people I study contemporary art and archaeology, they sometimes seem quite confused and ask, why? What is the connection between this two, these two? And they often expect me to provide them with, with some kind of a simple answer. But there is so many angles to look at this relationship that this is impossible um, to, uh, uh, to cover this in a few minutes of talking. Attempting to answer the question, one could point out the parallel visions of artists and archaeologists um, that Colin Renfrew did in figuring it out, putting an emphasis on how artists and archaeologists share the same interest in figuring out who we are as humans. Another way of seeing art and archaeology is for the engagement with material world that both of these disciplines involve. And finally, there is also the fascination with the past, which many artists explore within their works. What is it? How do we deal with it? With it? How can we learn from it? During the course, we are presented with a lot of different ways to engage with art and archaeology. During the core module this semester, we, for example, had lectures on creative mapping, collaboration in practice, media archaeology, or rock and graffiti art. These are just examples, but the range of topics relating art to archaeology is really vast. This semester, apart from the core art and archaeology module, as a full-time student, I also took one archaeological and one art module. Um, I have chosen to study the archaeology of the highlands and islands as my archaeological choice and art and environment as the art one. Uh, even though the subjects of these modules might seem quite different, they were both really helpful in thinking about art and archaeology and expanded my horizons, allowing me to see the interconnections between art environment and archaeology. Through these interconnections, we can not only process the past, 
but also respond to it and in fact make a contribution to forming the present and future. Being contemporary means constantly engaging with what was before us, consciously or unconsciously. I think it is important to study disengagements and to think about their nature and meaning. Archaeological thinking in contemporary art can take many forms. It may be by attempting to ask questions about the human condition, about time and its nature, about the physicality of things, or about the human engagement with the material world. It might touch on thousands of different subjects and themes, reflect on so many aspects of the world we inhabit, and all of these are incredibly valuable investigations that add to our understanding of ourselves and our environments. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Helena. Um, I appreciate it and thank all the speakers um, for their fantastic presentations, really. Um, we have an opportunity now um, for a brief time to have discussion um, amongst the panelists and to respond to questions which the audience can post in the chat if you wish to ask specific questions that we can try to address. So um, I'd like to kick it off. Um, I have a number of um, things I'd like to ask about, but first I'd like to ask the panelists if they have questions of the other panelists that they'd like to raise briefly, briefly. There's no compulsion for that. I'd just like to say I I really um, responded to, I thought it was fantastic the way Helena summed up what being contemporary was, this idea that we have to look at the past as well as the future. And that's what it was to be contemporary. What a neat way to summarize that. So thank you. Yes, I think in order to be new, you always have to relate yourself to the old. <laughs> yeah, so. There are three things I wanted to think about amongst many that um, the depth and range of the presentations raised. One um, was briefly mentioned by Helena, which was the issue of time. And um, it seems to me that the, all of the artists talked about time without articulating um, the issue of time that um, sort of underpins much of their work. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, and the, the question that I have is about the idea of the contemporary, um, which again, Helena raised. And, and that is if you're making work in a contemporary sense, how does that describe um, time, the time that you're dealing with in the archeological sense? So that's the, the first question. The, the second question I, I found fascinating by um, the artist is the question of travel. The fact that all of you have to go to far places to undertake this archeological work and landing in foreign countries, I wonder how that affects the nature of your, first of all, your perceptions and, and secondly, about your depictions, about the kind of marks and processes you make. The third question I wanted to you to think about very briefly is to do with um, the idea of the surface. Um, I was struck in looking at the slides and listening to you talk, um, how much this work is about sculpture and that the idea of a drawing as uh, a surface depiction or a trace or a document or a, a relatively um, flat artifact that you can pile in drawers of one way or another that you've exploded um, that process and uh, um, all of you producing sculpture, essentially. So I guess those are three things I'd like you to comment on um, initially, and then we'll explore some other questions as well. Yeah, please, Faye. Um, 
So archaeologists are deeply invested and interested in time. And in fact, to link the two questions together, we're time travelers. Um, <laughs> and we use, in this case, our drawing process and practice and what we do um, to facilitate our time traveling. Generally speaking, as archaeologists, contemporary archaeologists, we look to the past to understand the future, to then anticipate. Um, sorry, to understand the present, to anticipate the future, look to the past, to understand us now, to look to the future. And so we pivot around those inquiries then. But we work with different, what we would call archaeologically as temporalities. And there's so much in the archaeological literature about this. So we have linear time in terms of the way we structure the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman, Anglo-Saxon period. So we have a linear time period. But then as archaeologists, because we're thinking about people and what they did and how they perceived or engaged with their world, we often talk about time as event, or in fact time as events, in the sense that we have lots of events happening concurrently um, together. And then we can talk about time as layered, time as having agency, um, time more as cyclical um, rather than linear as well. So we can take a, a factual radiocarbon date that gives us a fixed time of 3200 BC, but how we interpret that time in the social way is open to all kinds of possibilities. And that's where archeologists can travel around and engage with time in that way. It's such a wonderful, um, topic to explore. And I think, you know, for us in the drawing, that that idea of the embeddedness of time in our work is such a fascinating conversation to have. You know, what are we doing when we're referring to these ancient places? Um, and what is the drawing and where does the drawing sit in this broad temporality, temporality of contemporary art practice and an ancient site in Anatolia? You know, where, where is time fusing and what's happening in temporalities there as well? So it's an absolutely incredible, wonderful um, conversation. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm not quite sure where to begin um, on the three questions. Sarah, do you want to go first? And then I'll... I could just say, I think that was a wonderful, I don't think I can really follow Faye on time. That was such a wonderful um, way of presenting it. Although one thing I might say is that certainly with this work that I talked about with um, glacial archaeology, is one of the things that's quite hard to get a purchase on was this very idea of time, these long spans of time and the relation of the human lifespan or my experience in relation to these, um, the passage of many, many, many years and cycles of time and cycles of freeze and thaw as well. And it's just to remark that we think we use the metaphor, we talk about things being glacially slow, but actually they're moving pretty fast um, within that context. And so I think that's one of the things that I was trying to do with the drawing was to use it to get a purchase on this kind of slippery sense of time, all these different meanings and the way it is so hard. It's a something that's quite hard to get a purchase on and using drawing to try and make a start on that. And I would add them conceptually trying to think about how you relate to people that lived you know, 8,000 years BC, 10,000 years ago. Um, I think the one thing that's really critical is drawing is such um, an innate thing, and it's something that all, all people, most cultures do. Um, it's also something that's quite an ancient way of understanding. So that sense of trying to make that connection through the trace of thinking through drawing um, in alignment to the trace of uh, both human habitation and human, a very sophisticated human culture, um, but actually trying to make somewhere through the the very tacit responses that I have certainly they're, they're very certainly not planned. They're very much about trusting the relationship of using all of the senses to explore through mark making to see what you think, see how you've responded to understand something through that particular lens. Um, but I think in terms of time, the trace of thinking is embedded in drawing. Um, and I think the nature of the drawings I made and the nature of the drawings that we've seen from 
they and Sarah are certainly about understanding um, a conceptual journey, which is a journey that's being conceptualized in the present uh, through the act of drawing. Thank you. I mean, following on from that, I, I want to ask a question about the relationship between science and art. Um, science, obviously, well, not obviously, but is is driven by um, evidence and the pursuit of certain um, truths or realities that are uh, provable. And and art can certainly do that um, in, in ways. But what I'm struck with in all of your work um, that I've seen is the intensity of the expressive qualities and expression um, particularly artistic expression is like an additive to the issue of knowledge um, around the art the archaeology of artifacts and archaeology of discovery of, of material culture from deep time or from times past so I'm wondering what your comments are or your thoughts are about the idea of what you're doing as artists in relationship to archaeology, because I know you've all thought about that a great deal, what you're doing um, in terms of um, the role expressivity plays or artistic practice plays in its relationship to archaeology. I can. Yeah, please. Go, go first here, um, only because a similar question came up in, in the last one of these um, um, talks when we were joined by two glacial archaeologists, um, Marcel Cornelison and Regula Gubla. And in that, I think the question was, what, you, you get a lot from the archaeologists. You're, you're clearly, it's feeding, it's giving you subject matter to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but what do the archaeologists get back and that prompted a kind of discussion afterwards between myself and the the archaeologists and one of the things that emerged was this way of expressing ideas uh, a kind of voice to give voice give a voice to the objects and artifacts to speak in a way that was non-verbal or as a, a tool for communicating something about them um, and with the capacity to kind of the poetics enables a kind of imaginative I don't know, transportation to kind of think into the objects to think around their conditions without thinking purely about the the facts that they present so a way into thinking about the stories and I don't know if anyone wants to say more about archaeology and kind of stories how that which I know play an important role in um, um consolidating what's knowledge within the, that field um, I think the drawings become a tool for being being a voice. I think. Yeah, that's um, storytelling is such a, an important archaeological process. And I think there's something to be said here about disciplinarity. Archaeologists, by their very training in nature, have the capacity to uh, are transdisciplinary um, um, in their in their field so you can specialize in particular things but we bring people together <laughs> to to open up conversations and to learn from each other and to and to collectively write those stories so you will bring in a geomorphologist onto a site or a glaciologist all these wonderful glaciologists you've been working with Sarah who understand ice and topography and land and climate with somebody who can look at some um, worked obsidian flakes in your site there, Anita, and understand how it was napped and how it was made and how it was used. Um, and then you bring in an artist to, to engage with the, the materiality of the object or to, to add another dimension to that conversation about the the, the object, the place and the people. And I think um, artistic practice and artists and archeologists, whether they are people who define themselves distinctly, or I think we are all doing it together, um, actually reflects very much on archeology span as a discipline. And pro probably I would say also reflects on artists um, who have that capacity to work together as well. So there's a synergy between the two, but archeologists, can and by their nature and by the discipline are, I would say, inherently transdisciplinary. 
And, and I would say, I mean, I think we did those very extensive seminar series with quite senior archaeologists. I mean, clearly the site in the Shickley set out with the proposition about what contemporary artists might reflect and distill from the site. And I, and I think while you might talk about it being expressive, I think there's also other alternative forms of knowledge and understanding that, that come through that practice of thinking through making and responding um, and using, in this instance, drawing. Uh, and I think, you know, I was really struck by the very senior archaeologist um, who's spoken in, in Dundee and the response to the sense of the artist who'd made the, recons the, the film and video of the site and passing of light, which gave you a sense of, so Eva Bosch, who had given a sense of actually how light would have been understood in that time because it recreated um, and recorded through the um, reconstruction houses um, how time would have passed and what you would have heard and you'd hear the river and the birds and everything else. It gave a real sense of what it might be like to live in that space. And obviously that conversation about the mirrors um, and actually seeing yourself is actually, you know, the, the, the capacity to draw attention to things that people may not be looking for within that domain um, because you're really excited to find the mirrors but actually what what conceptually are mirrors and how would they have transformed the way that people understood themselves and understood each other um, through the making of them so, so I think it's the capacity of a different thought process a different generation of new knowledge um, through the that practice and and response mode. I'm also struck about um, the idea of the body in space and the body being used as a uh, delineation of landscape. So the figure in the landscape, but also the figure defining the landscape, and the body being um, degenerative. Um, element in that process of, of um, interacting with the landscape. Um, and then comparing that with something that you've emphasized, all of you have emphasized a great deal, is the fragility and precarity of um, the archaeological process, particularly when drawings overlaid with that archaeological process. It seems to me that discussions about drawing in the body um, in relationship to space and the landscape are, are very powerful. They're very um, insertive. They're putting the body um, within the landscape, using it as a device to measure um, um, the land, measure places. And yet the artifacts that you're dealing with are very um, fragile very um, sort of shy almost. And there's a, a great sense of, I don't think anyone used this word exactly, but a great sense of, of loss associated with with recover, with recover um, with archaeology. Now I wonder what, what and particularly I guess, um, um, Faye and Anita um, talk about the issue of, of the body um, in relationship to drawing and archaeology. And anyone else who want Sarah to and Helena. I think we identify everything through the sense of scale and physicality of the body. I mean, that's the, the thing we inhabit, which is partly why I'm interested in how we understand that in different dimensions. Um, so for, for me, it is that sense of um a re the sense of rehearsal, I think, is also part of it, is that we rehearse that history or our understanding of the history through our own understanding of uh, our own physicality and physical trace and experience, our extent. I mean, you know, clearly that our measurement is all based on our reach, our stretch, our physical, physical experience of being in a space. Mm. I was particularly drawn by the presence of the body in Sarah's drawing of her shoes and her boots. 
you know, there's a body there. It's the drawing of the boot, and I imagine and see the body and the person who, who was in there in this wonderful process of layering that you're doing there, Sarah, and the, 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 it, your drawing is, ex, you know, drawing the, the, the shoe and then excavating it through the process that you're doing there. There's a real sense of corporeality, corporeal presence in, in, that, in that drawing, and, and then the storytelling and the imagination of the person who wore the shoe that was in the place in which you then stand <laughs> and take the drawing back to the place from which it came from. That's such a wonderful process. That's, that's uh, a sort of, uh, um, to use the term, mirror, the mirror of our archaeology so archaeology by its nature is a process of destruction if you excavate a site you're destroying it but then we build our understanding of it through our um through our engagement with it through science through drawing through art and then and then we do wonderful things which is what you did there Sarah by taking your <laughs> taking that drawing back to the the site and under the sun and then the drawing itself you know transforming is it's just that process is really reflective of archaeological um thinking there Thank you, Faye. That's um, it's really, really interesting to hear that. I mean, I, my interest in the archaeology has grown out of a practice which is keeps returning to clothing and the kind of absence of the body in that clothing. And this was another context in which I was found, but one that seemed especially pertinent, just given where it was found and how the um, how the sites, this idea of the glacier has this is associated with the, the loss associated with them um, the climate emergency um but yeah the shoes are just you could when you're drawing you're seeing the shape of that body oh it's it's been informed by the ice formed by the wear formed by the manufacturers so there's all these different layers of kind of marks and handling and the shaping of the artifact um as it has come down to you to be in front of you today so yeah it's, yeah. it's really fascinating wonderful thank you Something you didn't really address, any of you, I don't think, was my question about um, the sculptural or three-dimensional quality of the work. Is, is that something you want to comment on or just ignore? I'm happy if you ignore it. Why, why shouldn't it be sculptural? I mean, a drawing is still an object, even if it's just a very fine and thin one. That's a I'm, very thin I'm not saying object. it shouldn't be. I'm, I'm asking what, what you guys think about it. For me, it was quite important because by making something that had a material presence, albeit a very fine and slight one, there's a, it gives the work, I guess, a sense of corporeality and a confrontation. We don't stand back perhaps to look at it on the wall. It's an it enables a sense of encounter or directness and perhaps a, a positioning of the view viewer in relation to the work. So a relation, it for me, I think it helps set up that relationship between the viewer and the artifact. Um, yeah, I would agree that I think the the drawing is a um, process and outcome of multidimensional thinking <laughs> and engagement. Um, um, and you can see that often in the, the actual sort of the, um, condition of the work itself, all of the drawings have, kind of, have got shape and form to them, but, but what, for me, when I look at the work that we're looking at and when I'm making it, it's it's a very it's a prism. <laughs> then the drawing is a kind of prism um, in its making and in, and in what happens there. Yeah. And I would say that mine are actually flat; they're just over scale, um, but they do occupy space. And I think that's entirely to do with something that is body human sized in terms of the scale of the work. Um, but clearly is exerting um, it's exerting the sense that we can actually declare something about scale, private to public, and something that draws people in. So it's an invitation from afar in itself uh, to engage with the surface and the trace of thinking around how that's regenerated. And to some degree, the way the charcoal is used does carve out light uh, from the surface. So they do have a relationship. To sculpture but I haven't actually thought of them in those terms. So it's good. We, we're running out of time but I want to ask one more quick question which is that 
uh, we've talked about the work in relationship to archaeology, the, the idea of drawing and creating artwork in relationship to archaeology. Now, all of that work enters a different world. It goes into some exhibitionary space. How do you see that future of the work? Does it trail with it the, the, the discourse of archaeology? Or is that just a kind of contextual container for the work, work taking its role within the, the world of art and museums and the study of visuality? Speaking as a phenomenologist, I would say it holds the essence <laughs> of the place and the people within which the drawing draws upon. And so the archaeology stays deeply inherent within the materiality of the work that's out there. And, and I would say through the subject and the, the underpinning information, it, it, it retains its full relationship to its source. It's a residue of all that thinking. Um, and actually then it enters another domain. And I think that's one of the rather wonderful things about the permeability and the um, mobility of drawing uh, in particular, is that it can move between these different disciplinary dimensions and yet retain its dialogue across um, both or more than one discipline. Mm -hmm. Just before we go, I want to ask if anybody from the panel want to make any final remarks? None other than to say thank you for yes. fantastic presentations from the other panelists and brilliant chairing, Gary, and um, there's a whole conversation that could continue beyond mm -hmm. an hour and 15 minutes. So thank you. Thank I'd you like to, to thank the presenters um, Faye, uh, Sarah, Anita, and Helena um, for their extraordinarily really rich and um, yet accessible um, uh, presentations. Uh, I found them really compelling and I hope that the audience did as well. So thank you very much and um, best wishes for the holidays. Thank, thank you, Gary. Time thank for a thank you, Gary. And just to say, Sarah's show continues to the 28th of January. Sorry, forgot that. <laughs> we look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Um, when I put my other hat on. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.